2019 in our county. We will start with this year's State of the County Address. Executive Ike Leggett delivered the annual address at the Silver Spring Civic Center. It was a packed house that got to listen to the many challenges faced during the last six years of Leggett's tenure as county executive, and which also brought a positive outlook toward the financial future. When I sold office, I knew that Montgomery County was going through not just a transition, but a transformation in who we are, how we live, how we earn our living, and how we manage the county's finances and invest in the future. We are one of the most affluent counties in all of America, and we are one of the most diverse. According to the 2010 census, we have become a majority minority county for the first time. The executive laid out three new initiatives for the county, Open for Business, English Language on Demand, and Partnership for Educational Achievement, especially underperforming students. The hours between three and five are critical because that's when many of our youth are most at risk of involving themselves in risky behavior. So by providing quality programs that they want to participate in, it provides a great resource for our community and the students themselves. All the good news, despite the lingering recession, there has been a 3.4 increase in jobs in the county, and for the foreseeable future, some 100,000 jobs in biotechnology. I thought it was a really good speech. I thought he highlighted the right points, and I think he told the story about where we were when he came into office and where we are now, and I think it's a good story. We're a lot better off um, than when he took over. I, I thought he was the right candidate for county executive, and I think the last seven years have proven he was, wasn't only the best candidate, he's been the right county executive. I'm really happy with where, we're, where we are. Uh, it was a good night. It was the first time in four years the county executive has given his state of the county address. And we've been through a lot in those four years. I thought it was a very helpful uh, summary of the journey that we've been on recovering from this economic crisis. As of January 1st this year, same-sex marriage became legal in the state of Maryland. Although the courthouse was closed on New Year's Day, it reopened on January 2nd with several same-sex weddings on the calendar. Sonia Burke met some of those local couples who wasted no time in changing their statuses from single to married. Sonia? It's a historic day in Montgomery County, as you can tell from the supporters behind me, as the first same-sex marriages took place today here at the courthouse. Because we're going to the courthouse and we're going to get married. The first same-sex couple to get married at the Montgomery County Courthouse has been together for over 13 years. We can love each other and, yeah. and, be, equal. and be seen as, as a married couple. Yeah. The second couple met on Facebook and traveled to Montgomery County from Washington, D.C. for their wedding. You know, being able to marry someone I, I you know, love, been loving, will always love, you know, that's a great feeling. The first female couple to wed at the courthouse are Bethesda residents. They said their vows after lunch on January 2nd. <laughs> I love and adore you. I know, me too. I don't know, I pretty much knew from the very beginning when I saw her, so. She shakes me relentlessly. <laughs> On this historic day, Clerk of the Court Loretta Knight officiated at each of the same-sex marriages. We have a standard civil ceremony and we've changed the wording to incorporate a spouse instead of husband and wife. And then at the end we say that you are legally married. As a lesbian, I, this is a, a day that I never thought that I would see in my lifetime, so it's really, really important to me that um, we get to have equal rights like everybody else. I, I could never imagine as a kid growing up in Mississippi being standing outside a courthouse where people are actually getting married, like same-sex couples are getting married. I think if I had known that as a kid, I'd be more excited about my future. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's a historic uh, day for Montgomery County and for all of us here at the courthouse. We're very happy for everyone. For County Report this week, I'm Sonia Burke reporting. Love This year, a major step was taken to bring the Purple Line project closer to reality. Susan Kennedy brought us the story when the governor announced plans for a public-private partnership. So we are here today at the future home of Maryland's Purple Line here in Bethesda, Maryland. 
Surrounded by local leaders and supporters, the governor announced plans for a $400 million state investment towards the construction of the Purple Line. O'Malley told the crowd the state will seek out a private firm to build the $2.2 billion project, making this the state's first public-private partnership. In order for a modern economy to create jobs and expand opportunity, we have to be willing to make modern investments. In total, the Transportation Act will invest $4.4 billion, supporting over 57,000 jobs over the next six years. Better choices in order to achieve better results. Together, our great Seneca Science Carter, Shaded Grove Sector Plan, White Flint Plan, White Oak Gateway Plan Center are projected to produce, get this, 100,000 new jobs. That's the largest single addition in the county's history. With this announcement, the state has now committed close to $800 million for the light rail line, including $280 million budgeted earlier this year for final design work and purchase of the right-of-way. The public-private partnership would allow the state to share the cost of building the Purple Line with a private firm while paying them a fee to operate it. Business uh, wants to partner with government on building the large infrastructure um, projects that need to be funded. Without this infusion of the private sector money, we would not see the Purple Line. What the governor did here today puts Montgomery County and the state of Maryland in the forefront of what's happening in the nation, that these kinds of infrastructure projects have to be done in partnership with uh, the, the people in the business community. So we couldn't be happier. I think this is an example of taxpayer money very well spent. Councilmember George Leventhal has been a longtime supporter of the Purple Line. He says it's key to the economic future of the county and the state. We're looking ahead to a bright future for our local economy, and I love to see the partnership between the two counties. Our future lies in regional cooperation, and that's what the Purple Line is all about, bringing us together as a region and making it easier for us to expand, to get higher education. Also at the press conference, O'Malley announced funding for even more transportation in Montgomery County, including $25 million to build the Brookville Bypass and $100 million for the first phase of the Quarter Cities Transit transit way. Actual work on the Purple Line is scheduled to begin in 2015. In Bethesda, I'm Susan Kennedy for County Report This Week. When we come back, gun control legislation is approved this year in the Maryland Assembly. And the city of Rockville elected a new mayor and council members. All this when County Report This Week returns. Did you know there are more than 10,000 county government phone numbers? But there's only one number you need to remember for non-emergency calls, 311. MC311 is Montgomery County government's online telephone information system. Need information? Have a problem or complaint? Trying to locate a county government facility? Call 311. The call center is open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The website is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you for staying tuned to this special edition of County Report this week. I'm Lorna Pagelli, and we're showcasing the events that made 2013 such an amazing year. Gun control was a big priority during the legislative session in Annapolis this year. Over 40 bills were introduced regarding gun regulations. Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, along with County Executive Ike Leggett, held a public forum here in Montgomery County to listen to residents' opinions regarding this controversial issue. I, for one, a veteran as well, uh, I, I will not pay to exercise my constitutional rights. I'm willing to do anything and everything that I can possibly do to keep our children safe so that 6-11 never happens again. No doubt it will be a controversial debate in Annapolis, but the voices against and in favor of the governor's firearms limitation package resonated in an open forum at the county council building. There are people that feel strongly uh, that we're not doing enough uh, to uh, control guns and to keep them out of the hands of criminals, and there are others that believe that uh, we're overstepping. So our, our responsibility is to find the balance uh, where um, law-abiding citizens 
uh, can exercise their right uh, to own a handgun uh, and particularly to defend themselves, uh, but where criminals um, certainly um, don't have that same ability. Uh, our licensing regime, our licensing requirement is designed to eliminate straw purchases. Maryland's Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown took the heat from most participants about the Firearms Safety Act of 2013 that is being supported by the administration. They call it a comprehensive approach to gun restrictions of military-style weapons. The bills now on the House and Senate Judiciary Committees also include $25 million to enhance school security and expands the categories of prohibited individuals with mental health issues from obtaining a gun. There's a targeted expansion in the area of mental health for a, a subset, a very small subset of individuals who may be at the greatest risk of committing violence against others because of mental illness. So for example, people who are ordered into a psychiatric institution because of a condition that is associated with violence against others, those individuals would no longer be allowed to own firearms. There would be a process by which they could get their ability to own firearms back. A gun control measure was approved and signed into law earlier this year. This past November, the city of Rockville held elections. The voters elected a majority female council and a new female mayor. The city's 64th mayor and council were sworn in, and the newly elected officials shared some of their priorities for the next term. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the 64th mayor and council of Rockville. Please stand. Day and you heard all the good, you know, energy and comments. And this is going to be a wonderful council. I'm very much looking forward to working with all four council members. But we'll be talking about more school construction funding for this Montgomery County that will then reverberate to Rockville. Uh, Rockville Pike Plan should be coming to us soon from the Planning Commission. We've got to continue to work on Phase Two. We've got to continue to work in our neighborhoods to ensure that we're doing everything we can to help them. This is a, a great start. Uh, Mayor Newton had a, a terrific speech. I think she set us on a great course for the next two years. I'm very excited. I think the first thing that we have to take up is the charter changes. We have two good data points on this, the report from the Charter Review Commission and then the results of the advisory questions that uh, the voters voted on uh, two weeks ago. Um, and uh, we have to have, we want to have a really good uh, substantive public hearing on that and then make up our minds. I am truly feeling humbled, excited, uh, can't wait to serve the residents and everyone in Rockville, but humbled and awed at the responsibility and trust given to me in this election, and I can't wait to start serving. As I had said while I was campaigning, I'm looking forward to championing services for seniors, seeing where there are gaps, where there's duplication, how we can make outreach to seniors. Another thing that I'm concerned about and want to make sure is that we have sustainable budgets, not just for today, but for tomorrow and the next several years. I am very excited and very, very happy that today has finally come. It was a long campaign, but uh, now the real work begins, and I'm very much looking forward to serving the people of Rockville. I think there's going to be a number of important issues that are going to come before the mayor and council this time uh, in terms of the Rockville Pike Plan and having a good vision for that. But there's some new initiatives that I hope that we'll address, including around environmental issues and in terms of uh, services as well for residents. Well, there's, there's a little unrest in the city, and I want people to come together from all neighborhoods and I want, I'm the first African-American woman to be elected, so I want people to look at city, the city for the diversity that we have here. When you have an election of so many new uh, council members, there's always those items that didn't quite get completed, and that's going to be my first priority, seeing what's on the plate to look at right away. This is our opportunity, and together we will do great things. Thank you. A news report that touched us this year was one where community leaders and elected officials enrolled in a challenge to feed themselves on $5 a day. This was a pledge to get a taste of what life can be for thousands of low-income residents. A coalition of elected and nonprofit leaders assembled at Giant in Rockville to shop for five days worth of food. This is on sale sale. It's like half off. Spending no more than $5 per day. Led by Councilmember Valerie Irvin. I'm told there are 
there's meat on sale. That's More than 300 participants pledged to take part in the challenge and step outside their comfort zone. Oh, here's whole wheat bread. Oh, that's the expensive bread. I can't, I can't afford that. <laughs> and this is just not about myself or my colleagues. Thank you so much. It's about raising the awareness of poverty in our community and as elected officials and policymakers, what we can do about it. SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program served more than 65,000 families in Montgomery County in October of last year. I would like to have Josh, who's just been such a great supporter of this effort and a friend. And a School Superintendent Dr. Joshua Starr signed up for the challenge. He says issues of poverty show up in the schools on a daily basis. We have more poor children in Montgomery County than the District of Columbia has students enrolled in their public schools. Mm -hmm. If you took the poor kids in Montgomery County, we would be the sixth largest district. The officials took their time combing the aisles for the best deals, looking to stretch their budgets as far as they could go. The Snap the Silence Challenge not only seeks to raise awareness about poverty in the county, but it aims to bring stakeholders together to get involved in finding solutions to the issue. When you see data points that say that in the Kennedy Cluster area, you know, teenagers, when they were surveyed, said that their number one concern was getting a warm meal in the evening. It is time to put the spotlight squarely, and I think this is a great way to demonstrate how difficult it is. I have a giant card. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have a coupon, too. My colleagues and I have done a lot of work in this regard in Montgomery County. We're doing a lot of work around food and we want to continue to raise the awareness. Then let me figure out what to take off that we can do something about the problem of lack of food. I made it by 20 cents. No family should go without food. In the end, it's the hope of Councilmember Irvin that the Snap the Silence Challenge will make an impression that spurs action that will last a lifetime. When we come back, we'll tell you how the county is reaching out to potential Affordable Care Act enrollees. And one hotel giant opened headquarters in Rockville this year. Stay tuned. There's a reason why area law enforcement are out enforcing pedestrian and traffic safety laws and preventing killer pedestrian crashes. Be alert. Be street smart. Welcome back to this end of the year special edition of County Report this week. I'm Lorna Pagilli and we're bringing you the stories that made headlines this year. With the Affordable Care Act processing health insurance coverage starting on October 1st, County Executive Ike Leggett joined several officials to kick off the start of enrollment, making a call to all eligible county residents with the goal of having 53,000 enrollees by March 2014. The Affordable Health Care Act is the law. It has been signed by Congress, it's signed by the President and approved by Congress. It has been affirmed by the Supreme Court of the United States. We need to move on and do what is right for the many people in this capital region who do not have affordable health care. In starting today, we will intensify that effort to make sure that everyone that we can contact understand what is at stake, understand that they have a choice, and there is something that they can do about it. Our role is twofold. One, to properly educate and to inform people. And secondly, to make sure that they exercise the option that they would want in order to ensure that they have affordable health care. When you have health care, we must teach people to use it, right? That's important too, because if you haven't had it, you won't know what to do with it. So we have a responsibility, not just with the enrollment, but with beyond. So with that, I say thank you, and let's go forward and do great things. Thank you. There'll be three ways to enroll, online, by calling the state's call center, or sitting down with a navigator at community events or by appointment. The county will have about 80 navigators reaching out to eligible legal residents. 
Coverage is not free. The state's offered insurance premiums through private health plans promise to be affordable. If uninsured residents cannot afford the premiums, they may qualify for financial assistance or Medicaid through its expansion in Maryland. The application for financial assistance is available online. For enrollment at the state's new insurance marketplace, visit MarylandHealthConnection.gov. On the economic development side, this year Choice Hotels opened its New World headquarters in the heart of Rockville Town Square, bringing hundreds of associates and hundreds of franchise visitors to the area. Rockville 11 Bridget Suizo brought us that story. Bridget? That's right, I'm standing in front of the brand new Choice Hotels International Building right here on Rockville Pike. And it was all made possible through coordination between the city, the county, and the state. So good afternoon and welcome to the new worldwide headquarters of Choice Hotels International. Choice Hotels International headquarters can now call Rockville home. We couldn't have been more welcomed by the community. The support they gave us to help make this deal happen in the first place was instrumental in us being here. And we're, we're, we've been here since the 60s, and we want to be here for a long time to come. This has been a wonderful day for us, our company, for Choice Hotels. As you can see, they're starting sort of a new uh, uh, life here with us, and the community is really thrilled. So this is a great day. It was a day of celebrations for the Choice Hotels organization and for local elected officials. Oh, it's really a great addition to a community that's already thriving, but it thrives because people want to continue to live and work here. And so we're really pleased Choice Hotels made that decision. It's a testament to the commitment of the CEO, Steve Joyce, but a real team effort with the city of Rockville leadership, the state of Maryland, with Governor O'Malley and County Executive Ike Leggett to get the job done. really excited about this. This is what we've needed for a long time. In Indianapolis, we talk about jobs and we talk about friendly businesses and, and this is just what we needed and I congratulate the people in Rockville. As part of the event, attendees could take a tour of the new LEED Platinum headquarters where we found out more about the building and the celebration inside. The new state-of-the-art facility was built in only 21 months and is bringing more than 430 employees to downtown Rockville. It's a great location. Uh, it will be a big boost to the town center uh, with all the restaurants uh, that people will be going to and the uh, people will be coming here to work, uh, hundreds of employees. And it's very exciting to see the hotel uh, going up across the street. That hotel is part of the new ball project and will soon be a Cambria Suites Hotel, one of the upscale brands of choice, along with mixed-use residential and retail space as well as parking. When we come back, Montgomery County celebrates its first annual Montgomery County Executive Hispanic Gala. And this year, Montgomery College unveiled its new mascot. We'll be right back. Are you sure they can recycle us, Clamshell? Hey, Dome, we're on a new recycling postcard. I can't wait to make a new start. Maybe I'll be a red carpet at a big premiere. And I'll get to paint the White House. Shh, here he comes. <laughs> now you can recycle more plastics in Montgomery County, including number one PET plastics, such as clamshells, Nelly containers, trays, lids, domes, and cups. We're in! For more information on recycling, contact the Montgomery County, Maryland Division of Solid Waste Services at 311. The wait is over. Recycle more plastics today. Welcome back to County Report This Week. I'm Lorna Fagilli. Our show today highlights some of the stories that touched us in 2013. This year, for the first time in the county's history, the Montgomery County Executive Hispanic Gala celebrated Latino youth. The first annual Montgomery County Executive Hispanic Gala was a tremendous success. Over 800 people gathered at the Fillmore in Silver Spring to celebrate the contributions of Hispanic Americans in Montgomery County. Executive Ike Leggett hosted the event, which helped raise funds to assist Hispanic students achieve a high level of education. This is Montgomery County. We celebrate the heritage, the contribution, the hard work for a Latino Hispanic community that has helped build this county and this great nation. And we do so with pride, with respect, and with dignity. We do so to honor all of those who preceded us, those who had a much more difficult task 
to make certain that we can celebrate tonight to ensure that our children and grandchildren will have an easier time as they traverse through this great nation. 25 Latino students enrolled in Maryland colleges and universities received a $2,000 scholarship. The scholarship recipients were selected based on their academic achievement, community service, and financial need. They are majoring in engineering, biology, world health, bioscience, and cybersecurity, among other careers. All are attending seven different higher learning institutions in the state. This event gives students in Montgomery County an opportunity to reach a higher level education by providing the funds necessary to go to college, to go to universities. And not only that, but it provides hope for people who don't have the financial needs necessary to go to college. Part of the program included an awards ceremony. MCPS ESOL Counselor Maria Socorro Garcia was named Educator of the Year. Montgomery College President Dr. Darian Poller was awarded the Advocate of the Year Award. And United States Labor Secretary Tom Perez received the Public Service Award. But here in Montgomery County, we embrace our diversity. We embrace our immigrant communities that are doing so much for this county. We recognize that we're all in this together. We recognize that we are our brothers and our sisters keepers. We recognize that we all succeed when we all succeed, but we all succeed only when we all succeed. I had the honor and privilege to be the event's chair. The Montgomery County Executive Hispanic Gala will continue to be an annual marquee fundraising event to assist Hispanic students with necessary funds to continue their educational goals. This year, Montgomery College made history by unveiling its new mascot. The purple, white, silver, and black raptor will represent the college's athletic teams. Here is a story from Michael Brown. November 19th will go down in history as one of the most exciting and highly anticipated days in the long history of Montgomery College. The anticipation began over a year ago when the college announced it was going to a unified one college model. That meant that all three campuses and all the athletic teams would be competing under one common set of colors, one nickname, and one mascot. At the time of the announcement, MC unveiled its new colors, purple, black, silver, and white. Soon thereafter, the Raptor was chosen as the college's new mascot. But no one knew what the Raptor looked like or even what it actually was until November 19th, when MC held a day-long celebration to reveal their new mascot. And what a day it was. Students, faculty, and staff enjoyed a party on the Rockville campus as the clock counted down to the mascot reveal celebration. Radio station Hot 99.5 was on hand, rocking the campus and giving away concert tickets. There was food and all sorts of purple and silver giveaways. And then in the main gym, the excitement was ramped up with videos about the Raptor, MC's long athletic history, and a salute to the MC athletic teams by MC's president, Dr. Darian Pollard. I'm pretty pumped up about this. I think it's exciting about this moment in the history of Montgomery College, but also what it says about our athletic program and these phenomenal scholar athletes who stand behind me and the others you'll be meeting here today. The moment finally arrived and the new mascot was revealed to the packed house. The Raptor got to entertain the crowd at his first athletic event, a basketball doubleheader versus the men's and women's teams from Nova. And to top off the night, two great games for the Raptors. The nationally ranked MC women's team won 81 to 63 and the MC men's team knocked off the Nova men 89 to 72 making the new mascot very happy and finishing off what will certainly go down as one of the most exciting days in Montgomery College history. For County Report this week from Montgomery College, I'm Michael Brown. And on that fun note, we close this special edition of County Report this week. I'm Lorna Virgili, and we will return in 2014 with all of the stories that impact you as a county resident. From all of us here, we wish you a safe holiday season. And remember, the county offers sober ride services over the holidays. Call this number if you had one too many during the celebrations. Happy holidays.